Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe right here on J&J Media Network, Facebook Live, Twitch TV, Twitter, and on YouTube. I'm Jonah Malkin with you every single Monday and Wednesday morning, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 to 11 Central and 8 to 9 a.m. Pacific. Glad to have you with me on a Wednesday morning. A lot to discuss, a lot to get into previewing the NFL divisional round. The playoffs are underway. A great wild card weekend last Saturday. It's going to continue into the divisional round. Some news in the NBA. James Harden continues to be disgruntled with the Houston Rockets. More information on that. Kyrie Irving, his mysterious absence. I knew this guy is an enigma, but he's gone again. I'm going to touch into that as the show progresses. And then coming up at the top of the hour, NBC Sports' Ben Cross is going to join me to discuss the college football national championship game and much more in the NFL. So make sure to stick tuned to stay tuned with me. A lot of stuff to get into. So let me start, first of all, with my hometown. So I grew up in Los Angeles and the Rams are playing the Packers this weekend. And when I attended Wisconsin, I never experienced the cold before. I I'd, I'd traveled to New York. I traveled to Boston. I'd been to Europe during the winter. But I'd never really experienced Midwestern cold till I traveled to Wisconsin. Your toes are freezing. You can't feel your hands. Your nose is runny. Your ears are popping. Your eardrums are just exploding. This game right now between the Rams and the Packers, I don't know if the Rams fully understand the type of inclement weather they're getting themselves into. Now, it's, it was not their choice. That's the draw. This is the matchup, but this is probably the worst matchup for the Rams moving forward in this postseason. I truly believe that. And I think the biggest reason is because of the weather. I looked at the weather report. It's scheduled to snow Thursday and Friday. Rams are playing Saturday. So this is what makes the Packers so difficult. It's not just the fact that Lambeau Field is their home field. It's not just the fact that they're well coached. All those are important. But at the end of the day, the reason why the, the Packers are so difficult to beat is because when they have secured the number one seed, which they did, what that meant is any team facing them was going to have to travel to Lambeau in the middle of winter, in the dead winter. It's supposed to be 28 degrees. They are used to that climate to that weather they run the football effectively with Aaron Jones Aaron Rodgers is playing like an MVP this is the best team in the NFC and it's not just because of the number one seed it's because they've played like it they've won six straight games Aaron Rodgers again 4,300 passing yards the front runner for the MVP 48 touchdowns five interceptions this guy has had now the best touchdown to interception ratio since he's entered the NFL for six seasons. Best touchdown to interception ratio in the NFL. And you look at the type of role that he's been on, 71% completion percentage. And he it was really interesting because he talked about the difference between this year's 13-3 and three team and last year's 13-3 and three team. And what he said is it came down to the physicality and the confidence. He said last year they thought that he thought they were good enough to win the NFC and to win the whole thing. The 49ers were just a much more dominant team. They destroyed them in the two matchups. And so their confidence was shook right out of the gates. That physicality with Nick Bosa and that defensive line pressuring him constantly. That was the difference. And now you come into this year and he talked about two specific things with the offense that are extremely important to take into consideration. First of all, the efficiency with which their offense is working right now and the connection between he and Devontae Adams. You look at the Green Bay Packers this year and they've got the best efficiency in the red zone. They converted this whole year, sample size of 16 games, they converted on 80% of their trips into the red zone. And it's not, and it doesn't just mean scoring a field goal, scoring a touchdown on 80% of their trips. In the last three games, they've converted 92% of touchdowns in the red zone. 
over their last three games. This is a red hot offense, and he and Devontae Adams have a tremendous connection. Devontae Adams, 1,374 yards, 18 touchdowns. They have the best third down percentage in the NFL, and you add that additional element of the weather, and this Packers team is really, really tough. The question mark with the Rams is how's their defense going to hold up? Is Aaron Donald going to play and going to be effective? Sean uh, McVay came out yesterday saying that the Terminator, the the moniker used to describe Aaron Donald, will play. That's a that's a huge plus. But how effective will he be? He and Leonard Floyd Floyd combined for four sacks against Russell Wilson on Saturday. Two between the two of them. Can they replicate that again? I'm not sure. They're going to have to. Because David Bakhtiari, this offensive line for the Packers is arguably the best, if not worst case top three offensive lines in the NFL. Aaron Rodgers is notorious for getting the ball out quickly and not forcing issues. Just five interceptions. As I mentioned, this guy does not turn the ball over. The Packers as a team commit the fewest number of turnovers in the NFL. So the Rams are going to have to be able to generate that pressure with Donald, with Floyd up front, and then Jalen Ramsey's going to have to shadow Devontae Adams the entire night. He's going to have to. Even if Devontae Adams ends up playing in the slot as opposed to the outside, Jalen Ramsey's got to shadow him. Because, again, this connection has always been really strong between Adams and Rodgers, but not like this year. 18 touchdowns. So, and and Devontae Adams is a different type of receiver. He's a different type of beast than DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf is going to try and blow the torch and blow the top off the defense. He's really physical. He likes that physicality and aggressive nature. Devontae Adams is a slippery snake. This guy weaves in and out. Great route runner. He can catch in space, in traffic, in the slot, in the seams, on the flat. On go routes, doesn't matter. He's got tremendous touch, tremendous feel for the game, but he's not trying to get all up in Jalen Ramsey. That's not what this matchup's going to be. So I cannot wait for those for this matchup. And both of these teams are one and two in time of possession. So they take care of the football. They try and eat up clock because both of them have effective run games. In fact, I would argue the only real reason why the Rams have a good chance coming into this game, and the line is only minus seven. Now, most people think the line should be a little bit bigger, but the only reason why the line is only minus seven is because of the respect that Vegas has for the Rams defense one and their run game. Cam Akers, I said, is the guy. If you watch the Spy Kids movie, Game Over, the whole plot, they're trying to identify, is Junie the guy? Yeah, Cam Akers is the guy. That's what we established before. And he had 28 carries, 131 rushing yards and a touchdown against Seattle coming off a high ankle sprain. So you give him another week of rest with that offensive line. Andrew Whitworth is back. And that's the only way that the Rams are going to have a chance in this game is their ability to effectively run the football. And especially in the cold weather, you have to. Because Jared Goff already has a compromised thumb coming off surgery three weeks ago for a broken thumb. He was he was 9 of 19 against the Seahawks, which, listen, It's impressive that he was even out there, but now you're going up against the Packers in the cold with that hurt thumb. I don't expect Sean McVay to try and throw the football very much, and and even if John Wolford is able to come back, I still don't think they'll have him throw the football that much, especially in the cold cold, uh, weather. So you're going to have to be able to run the football effectively, and that's why the Rams have a chance on the backs of Cam Akers Maybe Malcolm Brown and Daryl Henderson can spell him from time to time. But this matchup, as I said, is the worst matchup of the remaining teams that the Rams could have faced. The best matchup if you're the Packers. And I I like the Packers right now at home. Listen, I'd love to be pleasantly surprised and shocked, just like I was against the Seahawks. I would love to see the L.A. Rams win. I'm from Los Angeles. But until you've experienced that type of cold, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. So I predict I predict that the Packers are going to beat the Rams 28 to 20 on Saturday morning or afternoon, whenever it is that they're playing. Uh, so 
this is this is going to be fun. Brady, Breeze, Tampa Bay, and New Orleans. If you remember, in the 1980s, in the NBA, if you were the Lakers or the Celtics, you knew that in order to win an NBA championship, you were going to have to go through one another. The Lakers were going to have to play the Celtics. Celtics were going to have to go through the Lakers to win a championship in the 1980s. Those two franchises combined for eight championships in that decade. Lakers took five. Celtics took three. They met up against each other three times. In tennis, if you are trying to win a Grand Slam, you know you are going to have to go through the big three, at least one member, if not all three members of the big three, Federer, Djokovic, Nadal. doesn't matter what you did against them at, at Indian Wells or the Beijing or Miami Open. It does not matter because if you want to win a Grand Slam, you are going to have to beat a member of the big three at the Australian Open, at Wimbledon, at the U.S. Open, or at the French Open. They are going to be there, and they're a different beast at the Grand Slam. And so to win a Grand Slam, you're going to have to beat one of them. The Saints knew that when Tom Brady signed with the Buccaneers, they were going to have to beat Brady in the postseason to ultimately achieve their goal, take that next step, and reach the Super Bowl. They knew that. Because the first two regular season meetings can pretty much be be rendered useless and are are meaningless at this point. I understand, yes, they dominated the Buccaneers 34 to 23 in on the opening day and then 38 to 3 the second go round in Tampa Bay. But those two regular season games don't mean anything. They really don't. And they knew that to reach the Super Bowl, that man, that obstacle, in Tom Brady, was going to be there to try and obstruct their path. Now, there's a lot of history on the line. These two players, first of all, the fact that they even played against each other at age 40, it was history in and of itself that two 40-year-old quarterbacks were going up against one another in the regular season. That never happened before. And now we're seeing that in the postseason. That's also never happened before. And Drew Brees has the overall edge over Tom Brady. They've met seven times, never in the postseason, all in the regular season. But in the regular season, Drew Brees has has won five of the seven matchups. So he does have the edge there. But as I talked about on Monday, their rivalry dates back to college, dates back to 1999 when Brady was with Michigan and Brees was with Purdue. And the Wolverines destroyed the Boilermakers. So this this rivalry dates back to 1999. And they each hold different records. Breeze for most passing yards. Brady for most touchdowns thrown. But again, if you're the New Orleans Saints and you're looking at, well, we beat them pretty handily the first two go-rounds in the season. Yeah, don't put too much stock into that. Because you give Tom Brady a third bite at the apple, I don't think he's going to miss. I don't think he's going to mess up this time. I really don't. And if anything, those two losses added more fuel to the fire. It's so difficult to beat a team three times, especially one in your own division. And if you're the team that has beaten them two previous times, to have the additional motivation to have more of this pent-up frustration towards your opponent, there's no way the Saints are going to have more motivation than the Buccaneers in this matchup because the Buccaneers lost to them twice already. So you give Tom Brady and this and this offense another chance to try and, and crack the code which is the New Orleans Saints, this is a different Buccaneers team than the one that we saw several weeks ago. 
This team is a top five offense in the NFL. They've averaged 38 points per game over their last three games. Tom Brady over his last five games has thrown 14 touchdowns to just one interception. So he's playing much better. Antonio Brown is having is making a presence right now. He's been actually a valuable addition so far and hasn't fractured the entire relationship that Brady has formulated with Chris Godwin, with Mike Evans, the entire team. They've all been effective. And the Saints, while their defense has been playing well and they beat the Bears 21-9, to I don't know if that was necessarily a really impressive win, but the key for me is the fact that now the Bucks are getting back Devin White, a major, major piece, perhaps their best defensive player. He missed the game against Washington because of the COVID, uh, because he was placed on the COVID list. And the Bucs still beat them 31-23. to And that, that was against a Washington team that was ranked number two in the NFL in total defense. And so I, I'm actually project, projecting and I'm going to say that the Buccaneers are going to upset the New Orleans Saints this weekend. I, I really believe it. I think somehow they'll find a way, and, and they, I think they're going to win 31-27. to 27. It's not going to be easy, and the, the Saints have the better roster. I just think you give a guy like Tom Brady three cracks – at the same team, I just don't see him losing all three times. I really don't. Uh, so I'm not a kid anymore, thankfully. But you can remember when you were a kid how great of a feeling it was, the, the elation and jubilation that filled you up if you were to go to a theme park, whether it's Disneyland, Universal Studios, Six Flags, Magic Mountain, and you've waited in line for an hour and you finally get up all the way to the top right and the last 40 people scoot in ahead of you they get in that cart they ride that roller coaster now it's your turn you get into the cart and you're about to ride this incredible roller coaster and the excitement that you have as you're about to embark on this, on this journey, on this thrill of a lifetime, right? That, that feeling that you have. Or if you're excited for a new movie to be released at a movie theater. I remember for me, I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. When Harry Potter movies came out, they always were released around the holiday season. And me and friends and family would get to the movie theater early. There'd be a line out the movie theater. And you have all this anticipation, all this almost nervous energy that's filling you up. And when they let you into the movie theater, you take your seat and you're super excited to see how the movie will unfold, right? That's the feeling that I have as I'm awaiting this matchup between the Baltimore Ravens and the Buffalo Bills. I've been excited about a lot of matchups and this one, I might be the most excited for. There's so much intrigue, so much unpredictability with how the Ravens and how the Bills are going to come out and play. And I said this before. I think I thought that the Bills were the Ravens from last year. I truly did. They reminded me exactly of the Ravens came in with the same type of winning record, with the same confidence and swagger, and nearly got upset in the first round, which I had initially predicted they would lose to the Colts. And they should have lost to the Colts, but they didn't. Credit to them for winning. But now they're going up against a Ravens squad that, again, has had to fight for every opportunity to make the playoffs. They had to win out. They had to win their past six games. They're riding a six-game winning streak. And... What's so interesting about these two teams is they're both top five in offense, but they do it in polar opposite fashions. The Ravens are the best run team in the league. They average 165 rushing yards per game to 236 passing yards per game. The Bills are the opposite. 
They're top two in passing yards per game at over 300 passing yards per game. And on the flip side, they run the ball 97 yards per game. So their offensive attack is polar opposite to that of the Ravens, which is why this matchup is so is so exciting is because I think that the Ravens are tailor-made to beat the Bills. I truly, truly believe that. The Bills like to rattle off big chunks with their offensive attack. And the connection between Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs is tremendous. They've been absolutely tremendous. Stephon Diggs has elevated himself as a top five, perhaps top three wide receiver with the way he's playing with Josh Allen. But the Ravens' defense is top 10 against the pass, top five overall. And what worries me is their inability to run the football and defend the run because the Ravens run the ball extremely well. And their ability to rattle off big chunk plays and hit the home run plays doesn't rely on the pass game, but relies on the legs of Lamar Jackson, which he showed against the Titans with that 48-yard touchdown run. So we're seeing the, the multitude of ways And the multifaceted nature of this Ravens offense, it's so unpredictable. Lamar can go out and throw for a couple hundred yards, but then he can also chime in 100 on the ground. He threw 179 passing yards against the Titans and then followed that up with 136 rushing yards. And the Ravens, I just think right now, they're the hottest team in football. They're the, the biggest wild card, literally. They've got the second best defense in the NFL. And yes, the Bills have won seven in a row. They've won 10 out of their last 11. But I thought they should have lost to the Colts. And and, and for one, there wasn't a single second when I was watching the Ravens against the Titans where I really thought they were going to lose. I truly just had this intrinsic feeling that Lamar Jackson, this was going the year. He, this was the year he was going to break through. And so I'm projecting that the Baltimore Ravens are going to go to, to Orchard Park in Buffalo, and upset the Bills 27-24. to I just see it playing out this way, and I'm I'm all in on the Ravens, not to win the whole thing. I like the Chiefs, but in this matchup, I've never fully bought into the Bills this entire season in terms of being a Super Bowl contender. I always thought that they could make the playoffs, which I thought that in and of itself was an accomplishment, and they won a playoff game for the first time in 25 years. I just think that this... Baltimore Ravens team can beat this Bills offense and just wear them down. And the difference between the the Ravens run game versus the Titans or other teams is that the Titans with Derrick Henry try to bruise you up. They try and bruise you up, eat time off the clock, and march slowly down the field. The Ravens don't have to do that. They can be just as efficient and as effective with big chunk plays on the ground. So I like the Ravens 27 to 24 over Buffalo uh, this weekend. I'm not going to touch on too much the Browns and the Chiefs. Congrats to the Browns for winning their first playoff game since 1969. What is that, 52 years? That's crazy. Congrats to them. The defense looked remarkable. Baker Mayfield played his best game as an NFL pro. But they they are riding such an, an such an emotional high right now, such an emotionally charged win that I, I don't know if that will sustain itself for four quarters against the Chiefs. I think they'll be able to play well in the first quarter. And even though the Chiefs haven't looked great and Patrick Mahomes hasn't played great during the last couple of games of the regular season, I just think this Chiefs team is, is a different beast in the postseason. And, and in essence, they're, they're, they haven't played in, in three weeks, which I get it. There was tremendous rust on the Ravens last year. I don't see that happening with the Chiefs this year. I think, if anything, they're getting healthier. And I, I just like this matchup too much for the Chiefs. I think they're tailor-made to beat the Browns. So I actually see them uh, rolling over the Browns pretty, pretty handily. Don't have a score prediction, but I just think they're probably going to win I haven't even checked the the spread yet, but if I had to bet, I'm going to say at least 10 points. I see them winning, maybe a a 30 to 20 type of game. So 
uh, we will see. All right, coming up in 10 minutes, NBC Sports' is Ben Cross will join me just around the corner. Appreciate you sticking with me on J&J Media Network. You're watching Morning Joe right here on Facebook Live, Twitch TV, Twitter, and on YouTube Mondays and Wednesday mornings, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So a couple quick uh, topics, you know, transition to the NBA for 10 minutes. And then, as I said, Ben Cross is joining me. Uh, I don't know if people have really been following the NBA much because it's kind of just been flying under the radar with football pretty much dominating the headlines. But James Harden, of course, has more to say. Disgruntled superstar out of Houston. And the Rockets just got absolutely blown off the court in back-to-back games against the Lakers. Last night, the most recent example, losing 117 to 110. But even the score doesn't reflect the competitiveness of that game. It was not competitive at all. You had LeBron, for, for Christ's sake, in the corner pulling a Steph, shoots a three, and turns around before the ball even goes through the net, dapping up his teammates. It's like he knew he had the foresight that it was going to go in. That's only stuff that Steph pulls off. That's how confident he was. THT was fantastic. I'm not going to go into the Laker, into my Lakers spiel because they're the best team in the NBA right now. But here's the problem with, with James Harden. So in the postgame conference, he added the comments, oh, I, I love the city. I love Houston. But and he says, I, I literally have done everything I can. I mean, this situation is crazy. It's something that I don't think can be fixed. OK, James Harden's got three years, 133 million left on his deal. You just turned down two years, 102 million dollars. And the Rockets have lost four of their last five games. And for four straight games, James Harden has scored 20 points or fewer. Now, I understand he's coming off a tweaked ankle, but here's what I don't like about James Harden right now, and he is a tremendous player, one of the best scorers that we've ever seen in the NBA. His ability to step back and shoot the three-pointer, to draw fouls, to shake defenders with his deceptiveness and his deceptive strength, he's an absolute all-time great player. But we're starting to see a trend, which is that he's difficult to play with. Everyone put the onus on Chris Paul when that relationship blew up. And look at what Chris Paul has done with New Orleans, with OKC, now with Phoenix. Phoenix is a top four seed in the Western Conference, and that's all because of the addition of CP3. And everyone was bashing CP3. Oh, if he was healthy, if he played better than the Rockets, would have won. Well, you trade him. You scoop up your friend, Russell Westbrook. And he gets irritated with you. And he wants a trade. He wants to go. So then you say, well, let's pair him with John Wall. Maybe, yes, he's coming off an injury, but let's see. Maybe the, these two can kind of re- resuscitate and rejuvenate their careers a little bit. You have DeMarcus Cousins. And then, of course, the relationship with John Wall is in the ditch. And John Wall even just came out and he said it's been a it's been rocky their relationship. Listen, Harden has averaged 30 points per game or more over his last 3 seasons since he arrived in Houston 9 years ago, he's averaged over 26 points per game. He is fantastic. Won the MVP for his career averaging 25 5 and 5. This year alone, he's averaging 26 points, 11 assists, and five rebounds. The 11 assists leads the NBA. But you came into training camp chunkier, to put it politely. You came out of shape. You just partied with the baby. All these issues are self-induced. And so for you to have the nerve to come out and start ridiculing your teammates for lack of effort, for lack of competitiveness, that starts with you. If you are the leader, which he is the de facto leader, and I think that he's great. But if you are the tone setter for your franchise and they look to you to send the message and to set the tone, well, the tone and the message that you're sending right now is that you don't care. And that's the issue. And I love James Harden, but right now you have to look in the mirror and take ownership and accountability for the way that your team is playing. If you're trying to throw the 
the issues on John Wall to a guy that hasn't played in two years after rupturing his Achilles or DeMarcus Cousins, who ruptured his Achilles and tore his ACL. You're sadly mistaken. Christian Wood is good. And you look at the Rockets roster and there's no excuse because there are teams that are ahead of them right now that don't have a better roster. Golden State Warriors would make the playoffs today. They're the sixth seed. Outside of Steph, who's a tremendous player, you compare the rosters, you're talking about Kelly Oubre, Andrew Wiggins, Eric Paschal, James Wiseman is raw. Is that better than the Rockets roster? John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins, James Harden, Eric Gordon. As I mentioned, Christian Wood, Daniel House. Even the Spurs are better than the Rockets right now. And I understand they've got Greg, Greg Popovich. He's a great coach. But you look at the roster. DeJounte Murray, DeMar DeRozan, LaMarcus Aldridge, who feels kind of like he's been irrelevant for the last two, three years. Jakob Pertle, Rudy Gay. You really can't beat those teams. You can't be better than even some of the bad teams in the Western Conference. The Sacramento Kings are better than the Houston Rockets. Outside of De'Aaron Fox, yeah, they got Buddy Heald, but Bogdan Bogdanovich just left. Corey Joseph is the next best player on the Sacramento Kings, so there, there's no excuse for the Rockets when you look at their roster. And listen, he's great, but if he truly cares about playing and competing, he's got to take ownership over his play. In the last five games, he's shooting 27% from the floor, 29% uh, from three, or actually the opposite, 29% from the field, 27% from the floor. Rockets are two and six in the games that he's played this year, one and zero oh without him. They're three and six. They are half a game above the Minnesota Timberwolves for the worst record in the Western Conference. James Harden, you got to start taking some ownership, man. I love you. You are a fantastic player, but don't try and spread the culpability here. It starts and ends with you. The buck stops with you. Uh, okay. Finally, last quick topic, and then Ben Cross, NBC Sports, joins me. Uh, so Kyrie Irving is missing another three games due to personal reason. Mysterious absence continues for Kyrie Irving. Listen, he, he's an enigma. We've known that. He's very thoughtful. He's very... Uh, introspective. Um, I don't want to say he's an introvert, but but he does have a unique view on on life. And listen, I don't want to throw out anything related to mental health, mental illness, just to throw it out there because it's a grave illness. It it can be perilous at times. And I'm not going to throw it out there just for the sake of throwing it out there, because if it's a legitimate excuse, okay. But here's the problem that I have right now. There, the issue is with transparency. There, there's been no official statement made that, hey, Kyrie is missing these games due to X, Y, or Z. The only thing we do know is that the, the, the insurrectionists ri uh, storming the Capitol and those riots that have taken place and the protests that are taking place have largely contributed to his absence. So recently he was seen on a Zoom call for one of the Manhattan District Attorney Democratic candidates. Uh, I believe the name is Tahani Abushi. Um, apologies if I, if I mispronounce the name. So he was seen on a Zoom call for her launch party over Zoom. He missed the game against the Denver Nuggets in which Durant went off yesterday, by the way for that for that zoom okay fine he's missed four four straight games but what worries me is that you have this narrative surrounding mental health and we've seen the effects it's had on demar Derozan. we've seen the effects it's had on kevin love but we don't know if that's really the issue and at face value It appears that that he's just supporting, uh, you know, racial and social injustice. That's totally fine. If that's the reason that you're missing games, that's totally fine. Then give the give the check back to Joseph Tsai, 
the, the owner of the Nets and remove yourself from basketball right now. If that's what you want to do, that's totally fine. That's absolutely fine. And you're right. But I can't even believe begin to imagine what Kevin Durant's feeling. Here you have a guy who who packed up shop, who had a great situation in Golden State to go with you to the Brooklyn Nets. And the first year, I understand, Kevin Durant was rehabbing. It didn't really matter. Last year, you were in and out of the lineup. That's fine. Then the first opportunity that you get to play with your buddy, to get to play with the guy that you said is the only mother F that you feel comfortable taking a shot toward, you know, at the end of a game. And now you're leaving this guy hanging. I mean, I'm sure he gave some reason to Durant. I'm sure he spoke to him. I, I, maybe he, I know he informed his teammates, but the Nets need you right now. And especially with Spencer Dinwiddie partially tearing his ACL, I didn't think that would be a huge blow to the team because they're extremely deep, especially at the guard position. But now if you remove Spencer Dinwiddie from the lineup and Kyrie Irving, all of a sudden this team isn't quite as deep as we thought they were. And Kevin Durant's probably a little bit ticked off right now. And if you're the Nets ownership, I, I didn't have this position. I didn't feel this way earlier in the season. But if 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 it is brought to your attention that Kyrie Irving does want to play basketball, does want to continue to play basketball, I, I'd look at shopping him. The minute he says he's willing to play basketball again, honestly, I think that is maybe when you call the Houston Rockets and you say, listen, let's let's put something together here. Let's put a Dinwiddie, Kyrie Irving, Karis LeVert, Jared Allen deal on the table for James Harden. Maybe they do it now. Because there's just so, I mean, he's such a fickle player. And I think that Kyrie Irving is the best ball handler I've ever seen. He's one of the most skilled basketball players I've ever seen. He is a muse on the basketball court. He's an artist. That's what he claims himself to be. That's what he is. But this, again, accentuates the absence of Spencer Dinwiddie. And if you're Kevin Durant, the whole reason you came to Brooklyn was for the culture and to play with Kyrie Irving. And now he's all of a sudden not there. So KD didn't even know what he was signing up for. This wasn't what he was signing up for. He's trying to rehab an Achilles, slowly work his way back up to shape. Now he's having to be thrown into the fire right away. So that's my take on that. We'll see what the Nets do. All right. So now it is my pleasure to bring on to the show uh, Ben Cross, NBC Sports' is Ben Cross, content curator and distributor. Uh, ben, great to have you, you on. It's been a little bit, uh, but I know that you've been still just keeping up to date with all the football games of college football. So listen, I, I certainly thought that Alabama was the better team going into it. I knew their offense was prolific and it's crazy to think that last year everyone was saying LSU's offense is the best offense they've ever seen and now you can make arguments that this Alabama team was better than that LSU offense from a season ago. Uh every time Alabama had the ball, it just seemed like as an Ohio State fan, if if you're an Ohio State fan or even if you're Ryan Day, you're just hoping for a field goal at that point. Uh, what was your reaction and take to that national title game? And, and was that at all surprising to you? What happened? It wasn't entirely surprising. I think I was surprised how little Ohio State was actually able to defend Devontae Smith in the first half. I mean, you look at his stats, I think he ended up with something around 225 yards in the game. And most of that, I think, came in the first half. A at that point, Point, the game was ultimately over. I think the question really was going to be, could Ohio State control the pace? You know, if you looked at Bama this whole year, they put up 50 points almost every game against some of the better defenses in the country as well. So the question was just going to be, is Ohio State going to be able to play their game? I mean, if you looked at Ohio State the last few weeks, they were playing their best football. You saw that game against Clemson. Why was that? It's because they had a balanced attack. You saw Trey Sermon out of the backfield. He was dominant in a few games before this national title game. He did almost nothing. I think he had a carry for two yards, and that was about it. 
that forces them to throw down the field and they can't keep up with Alabama. There was no offense in the country that could keep up with Alabama. The question was whether Ohio State's defense could hold them to the field, those field goals that you mentioned and control the pace a little bit better. But you look at Bama's offense, completely unstoppable. Nick Saban has taken over that system very, very well. And he absolutely had the athletes to do it this year. Najee Harris is an absolute beast. He actually caught more passes than I think he had rushes on the day. And then Devontae Smith, obviously just a one-man wrecking crew. Uh, justified his Heisman vote by a long mile. And uh, Mac Jones did what he needed to do. Everyone else did what they needed to do. It's not as if Bama's defense was stellar. They hadn't necessarily been known for that all year, but they did enough to allow their athletes to step in and really dominate the game. I wouldn't necessarily say they had a better offense than LSU's from last year. If you're comparing, you look at what LSU's offense has done in the NFL this past year. Justin Jefferson most likely going to, you know, I mean, he is on the um, yeah, uh, offensive rookie of the year. Right. I mean, he, he's up there for sure. Right, broke a few of Jerry Rice's records, and uh, you know, it, he is he's absolutely up there in a dominant force. Clyde edwards Uh, you know, Burrow was having a decent season before he went down. Joe Brady is in Carolina. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, so I, I think you could very well see a lot of athletes on this Bama team. Najee and Smith, no doubt, are going to be two of those guys that will show up in the NFL. But I think at the end of the day, LSU was probably better. Now, returning to the title game, I'm not really all that surprised. I guess I thought it was going to be closer than it turned out to be. And obviously, as as to be expected, all the rumblings about what next year is going to look like, if there's a potential expansion, Uh, What are your thoughts on what college football will look like next season? Do you expect there to be some kind of of expanded playoff format next year? I don't. I think there's a very good argument for it. I've seen a lot of people talk in in recent months about how expanding the playoff isn't necessarily just about giving other teams opportunities in the moment, but it's also about shifting the recruiting cycle and what we have as a system right now where there are only a few teams, you know, Bama, Ohio State, Clemson, that make the playoff every year, the recruits are just going to flock to those schools because they know they're going to get the most exposure. They're going to have the biggest opportunity to go straight to the league, uh, get the benefit of the doubt from NFL uh, recruiters. It is just ultimately this cycle that results in only a few teams getting all the talent and being unequivocally the best teams. And when it comes down to the selection process, the committee is going to give more respect to teams that have more talent on the field, whether or not they've necessarily earned it or deserved it. Those words have certainly uh, you know, flown around in the conversation. So I, I think it's inevitable that the playoff will be expanded. I think I saw Mac Brown talk about how they expect a 16 playoff at some point in the next few years. And then if that isn't necessarily what they're looking for, they'll go to eight, but I don't think it's going to happen this next year. I don't think there's enough momentum. I think you saw what happened in some of the bowl games uh, outside of the playoff. A lot of it justified what the committee did outside of a lot of people were calling for Ohio state and had not be in there. But I mean, you look at Ohio state, they only played six games prior to the playoff. And a lot of people were saying, oh, Texas a and this one lost team that has proved it more so than Ohio State. But Ohio State got the nod because they just have more talent. And in recent years, they've proved that they deserve more consideration. So I, I think the expanding the playoff is not just a good thing for those looking for more representation uh, in getting the playoff, like a team like Cincinnati or uh, teams like Iowa State, Oregon, you know, et cetera. I think it's also shifting that dynamic to a more competitive college football. That being said, I don't think we're one or two years away. I still think we're going to have this system for maybe three or four more years. Yeah, I mean, the one concern is that you don't want it to perpetuate the issue already, which is that the major power five schools garner more consideration for more teams to leapfrog some of these non-Power 5 schools. Um, Okay, so I said this before. I I didn't really think that there was much controversy around Justin Fields, whether or not he'd be the number two quarterback taken, but obviously there were rumblings prior to the Clemson game and even after the Northwestern matchup that maybe a guy like Zach Wilson out of BYU would be the second quarterback taken. And to me, I think that the his performance against Clemson was more indicative of who he really is as a football player when he's healthy and solidified his his stock as the number two quarterback taken but the interesting thing ben is if you're the jets and you've got a guy in sam and sam darnold do you do you consider maybe moving off of him 
to to sign a guy and draft a guy like Justin Fields, or better yet, if the Jets if the Jets opt against it, the Dolphins have the number three pick. Are you sure that they're fully convinced of Tua in the season that he's played? So where do you kind of see Justin Fields falling, and, and could you see both of those teams perhaps drafting him? There's absolutely bo- a, a scenario where both of those teams end up drafting him. I, I think when you look at the Jets, because obviously they're the domino that would have to fall to give the Dolphins a chance. I think the Dolphins would feel much more comfortable about that pick. I think the Jets, given their situation, they weren't a playoff team or uh, you know a bubble playoff team like the Dolphins were. I, I think they need someone who's going to come in and, and step up. I don't necessarily think Sam Darnold's the problem in uh, New York, and that's why I don't think they should necessarily rush to pick Fields. I think you look at the Clemson game, and there's a bit of recency bias there. You look at Fields throughout the season, he wasn't necessarily his dominant self, albeit a, a shortened and difficult season to get through. But I don't necessarily see Justin Fields as a guy who's going to come in and have an immediate impact. I, I think he has a great arm. He's obviously a great athlete. He's a tough guy. He's a smart guy. But I don't think he changes a franchise out of nowhere. And I think they should be looking at other options. I think the fact that they missed out on Trevor Lawrence is very tragic for them because I think the separation between Lawrence and some of these other quarterbacks is actually larger than we might thing seeing the playoff uh, scenario in which Clemson got destroyed by Ohio State and Justin Fields. That being said, I, I think when you look at that game, it did enough to put Justin Fields into that number two spot. And I think there's a very likely scenario that the Jets jump on him. If they don't, I think Justin Fields to the Dolphins would actually be a great pick because obviously look at how Tua came down the stretch. I don't think there's a ton of confidence in him right now. I don't think he makes great decisions. His arm didn't look as fresh. He didn't necessarily look as injured as some might expect him to be when he was going to the draft with that injury last year. But he didn't necessarily seem like a guy like Justin Herbert who came in and had this success when he had to. Obviously, Fitzpatrick putting the Dolphins in a position to potentially bank the playoffs, and obviously that didn't work out with him having COVID in the final week and them not winning to get into the playoffs. So I I think it's an interesting scenario, but I think Justin Fields ultimately ends up in New York and Sam Darnold gets shipped somewhere else. So I, I thought that Doug Peterson had he not benched prior, prior to benching Jalen hurts. I thought that, that he should have remained the head coach of Philly. I thought the guy that should have been shipped out of there was Carson once because he had a, just a tragically bad season. However, I totally understand the decision now to remove Doug Peterson after benching Jalen Hurts because you pretty much just shot his confidence and you told the locker room that you don't care about them whatsoever. So that seemed inevitable to me once he benched Jalen Hurts uh, that that he'd be out of there. Do you see this, though, as perhaps the organization's kind of last-ditch effort to try and instill confidence once again and kind of resuscitate uh, uh, Carson Wentz's potential career? And then what what do you think this means for Jalen Hurts moving forward and his progression as an NFL quarterback now that Doug Peterson's gone? Well, it's a big shot to Jalen Hurts. I mean, I wasn't necessarily a fan of him getting picked in the second round where he was. I thought the Eagles absolutely reached on him. But you know what? He looked very impressive in the situations he stepped into. And he gave the Eagles a chance to potentially come back and make the playoffs. I don't know why they would spend this last ditch effort on Carson Wentz. I think he's proven over the last year and a half or so that he really is more of a liability than he is an asset. Do I believe he could have success somewhere else? Maybe. But regardless, I think Doug Peterson dug his own grave in that scenario. He didn't alert the team. He didn't say, okay, this is what we're going to do to get this pick. Management wants me to you know, necessarily tank. I'm going to make this call. He didn't necessarily alert anyone. I I think Jalen Hurts and the team necessarily would have been fine with that decision if that's what they knew they were going with. Uh, It it was just a very difficult situation. And and with the, you know, poor rapport that he left his team in, I I think it was inevitable that he was getting shipped out. I don't think it's a good move by the Eagles. I I think they're putting themselves in a tough spot where they're going all in on Carson Wentz. They'll still have Jalen Hurts there, but I don't necessarily know if you want Jalen Hurts to be your entire backup plan, in which case you only have what Nate Sudfeld as the guy behind him, where you could look at this draft and potentially give Jalen Hurts more support. The Eagles have a ton of problems, and I don't think Carson Wentz eliminates those problems. I think he's certainly one of them. So giving him another chance, I think, is another distraction going into this next year, uh, depending on the head coach they end up hiring. 
And, and I think the Eagles are in a tough spot going in the off season. All right. Final two questions. Uh, and then I'll let you go. Who do you like in these matchups uh, and in the divisional round this weekend? Do you have any, any upsets or you think that the uh, higher seeded teams are going to win? I think if you look at the board, I think the higher seeded teams look like the teams to beat. I, I think a couple upset teams you could look at are, uh, the, I think the Buccaneers have a chance. I know they've been relatively inconsistent, but I think that's one of the reasons they might have a shot. The Saints defense is, is certainly electric, but I think the Buccaneers, if they can get rolling, have a good chance to necessarily stay with them. And, and the Saints have gotten a little predictable in some of their play calling. I, I think they could absolutely be in a close game. I, I know you were talking earlier about the Ravens-Bills game. I think that is potentially to be very close. I do think the Bills will ultimately pull that one out, but I think that could be a very close game. And I think a sneaky game that a lot of people aren't going to focus on is Rams-Packers. I, I know that Goff has dealt with some injury issues, and the Rams haven't necessarily been a dominant team all year. They certainly kind of stumbled into the playoffs. But if Goff can play healthy and McVay is – play calling at his best. The Packers have fallen into some trap games uh, throughout the year, and I think it'll be interesting to see. I think the one reason the Packers might ultimately open this one up is because Jared Goff is traveling to Lambeau in January. That's not an easy scenario for him, but we'll certainly see. I think ultimately I would be surprised if all but one of the top seeds didn't end up winning. Uh, this playoffs has certainly been interesting, but at the same time, if you look at some of the scores in the wildcard round, it wasn't all that surprising. Yeah, I actually said that with that Rams-Packers game, had they been playing any other time of the year, and maybe they've got a good chance, but I said, listen, I'm from Los Angeles. I've been to Wisconsin in the middle of winter. Uh, that takes some adjustment, and to try to make that adjustment in five days – is going to be hard. I think if you know yeah. if, if if Aaron Donald uh, can get some pressure and he's healthy, then they'll give themselves a chance with with the run yeah. game. Um, okay, so final question on a, on a basketball note did Did you watch Michigan over Wisconsin yesterday? I mean, that was a total drubbing in the Big Ten. I was I couldn't even believe the score at one point. I think they lost like seventy seven to fifty four. What the hell happened, Ben? What the hell was that? It was brutal. I'll tell you, I did not watch the entire game because I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And it was almost too painful for me to watch. Uh, I'll tell you, Wisconsin just looked like they're on a different floor than Michigan last night. And all the credit to Michigan. I, Wisconsin certainly made plenty of mistakes and got in their own way plenty. But if you look at Michigan over the last two weeks, they've beaten three top 25 teams by over 20 points. That That's a mark that I don't think has been set in decades, uh, if not ever. So you have to give credit to Michigan. They guarded Wisconsin very well on the ball, didn't give them many open looks. I mean, you look at Wisconsin as a team, they rely on making threes. And they didn't get all that many open looks, and they didn't hit the ones that they had. And then you look at Michigan on the offensive front. They got what they wanted at will. Wisconsin's generally one of the better defensive teams in the country. And Michigan just beat guys off the ball. Uh, Wisconsin didn't slide well. Michigan had great rotation. They were making all their shots in the first half, which gave them enough to separate. And then Wisconsin had a nice little stretch at the beginning of the second half, but it just wasn't enough. Michigan had a game plan, and they, they certainly stuck to it. It should be interesting to see. I, I believe the two teams have a rematch in mid-February in Madison to see you know how Wisconsin adjusts. But ultimately, if you're looking at Michigan right now, they have to be in consideration as one of those potential Final Four teams. They're cooking right now. They've showed almost zero weaknesses. It'll be interesting to see how, how that develops as the rest of the Big Ten is just a cage match at the moment, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. But Michigan is certainly separating themselves right now. And, and listen, I think that Jawan Howard is a great coach. Mm -hmm. He's a great coach, former player, obviously, you know, at Michigan, then with the Heat, won all these championships. So uh, he's a good recruiter. They're they're a good team. But I was just like, damn, guys, really? Mm -hmm. and, I had a, and I had a friend uh, shout me out on, on Twitter. Shout out to, to Avi Sholkoff. He, he tweeted me like mid game about the score. The only thing that I could do was send him back. Cause he, he's a Michigan guy. The only thing that I could do is send him back the score of Wisconsin football, crushing Michigan football earlier this year, 49 to 11. That was the only reprieve that I had and, and consolation prize. Uh, ben, thank you so much uh, for joining me, by the way, what do you think of the expanded studio? I got kind of behind here. I know the first time that you've been on the show, you know, I was keeping it more close, more intimate setting. Now I'm really, really expanding things out for you. 
It's very impressive. I mean, I, I can't say I'm surprised with the jersey setup you have behind you, but in general, it's, it's a, a very big step up, and I'm uh, glad to see you're moving up, Jonah. That's uh, it's a very impressive. It's better than this setup I have here in this uh, this Colorado house on vacation. Appreciate it, Ben. Listen, good to see you. Ben, uh, NBC Sports is Ben Cross, content curator, uh, and our college football and just sports insider, Ben Cross. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks man. for having me on, Jonah. All right. Ben Cross, always fun uh, to have him on. All right. Final topic of the day, Malkin's Moments. Uh, it's my favorite topic of the day. Every show and with my favorite moments from the past week, I have a number of great moments. So first of all, in the spirit of the Green Bay Packers in the divisional round, Aaron Rodgers just accepted a role to be the guest host of Jeopardy! after in in the off season which is something that he's been wanting to do his entire life he's been following it his whole life all 16 years that he's been with green bay packers he he says that he sets aside time from 5 to 6 p.m. to listen to the uh, the late great alex trebek um such a shame that that he passed away at such a young age but it's an incredible uh thrill for aaron rodgers so he's going to be a guest host of jeopardy and then two from alabama first of all Wide receiver Devontae Smith, the Heisman winner in the national championship game against Ohio State, 12 catches, 215 yards, three touchdowns, all in the first half. All in the first half. It was extremely dominant. And this is a kid who made it, who, who left an indelible mark on Alabama his freshman year when he caught the touchdown pass against Georgia in overtime to win the national championship for Alabama in 2017. And now. He's ending his career as the leading career receiver in the SEC and the most outstanding offensive player of his third title game. Absolutely fantastic. And then shout out to the great Nick Saban, who captured his seventh overall national championship as a head coach, breaking the tie with the Alabama great Paul Bear Bryant for the most by a major college coach. So shout out to Nick Saban and the Tide. All right. That's all the time that I got for you today. Thank you so much for joining me on a Wednesday. You've been watching and listening to Morning Joe right here on j, j Media Network, Facebook Live, Twitch TV, Twitter, and on YouTube every Monday and Wednesday morning, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 to 11 Central, and 8 to 9 a.m. Pacific. And as always, have a lovely rest of your morning.